Okay, and welcome back everyone. Uh, my name is Gillian Parker. I'm a senior manager on the policy insights team at Economist Impact here in Singapore. And today we're here to discuss the important topic of balancing solutions upstream and downstream. Um, it is rather apt that we're having this discussion uh, while the UN Treaty for Plastic Pollution is, is going on. Um, and with me today, uh, joining us, thank you, is Ariel Muller, Managing Director, Asia Pacific from Forum of the Fu for the Future. Joy Danielson, Partner of Systemic, welcome. Uh, Zhang, Zhang Han, uh, Global Sustainability Director, Packaging and Specialty Plastics at Dow. And finally, Amelia Fifield, Counselor and Director, ASEAN Cicero. Thank, Cicero. thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, tackling plastic, as we, we've just heard in the previous panel, is, is going to take an intricate set of solutions. And I think one of the solutions is dealing with it from upstream all the way, all the way to downstream. No single approach will be sufficient. And how can we really uh, adopt some of the measures to, to tackle plastic across the entire life cycle? Uh, Joy, I'll, 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 I'll lead this off. With, I'll kick this off with you first. How can governments in, in APAC uh, begin to adopt the suite of upstream and downstream measures required to address uh, plastic waste? And particularly, where should the capacity constrained countries begin? That's a great question. Um, I'd like to start on the collection side of things because we, um, we are growing into a population of 8 billion and 3 billion people do not have waste collection. And that means that 500,000 people per day have to be connected to waste collection. Um, so what we've seen working on the ground, in particular in Indonesia, which I think um, is representative of many places, is, is first get the enabling conditions right. Um, and these are things like making sure that there's strong governance at a local level that can actually manage funds if they come in. Um, and this also includes making sure that there's not a single leader that's responsible for success, but that um, you can create more of a systems approach. A second thing is making sure that the local economics work, that they're actually reliable mm -hmm. and, and um, large enough to actually professionalize um, the both waste collection and recycling. Um, you also want to make sure that you have capacity building um, so that you know, uh, your local governments can actually operate and um, set up and operate these waste systems. And then finally, um, making sure that governments define the ticket to play in their country. And, and this goes for, you know, let's say, um, extended purchase re responsibility, where if you want to sell goods in this country, these are the, these are the requirements. Um, and, and, you know, no, no industry wants to be regulated, but at the same time, they also don't want to have an unlevel playing field. And, um, and so if you can actually regulate and you can create that consistency, then everyone can adopt. You don't want to create the, the unintended um, incentive structure that to actually be sustainable, you have to be less competitive. Mm -hmm. So I would start in those ways. <laughs> those are <laughs> just a few, yeah, those are great points to begin with. Ariel, do you want to add on to? Sure, definitely. That? So yeah. I think um, in terms of responding to that question, uh, I'm going to speak from our experience, uh, particularly on the microfiber challenge, which is quite a ti the tiny little fibers that are showing up uh, in mother's milk, top of Everest, things like that. And there's not a clear market solution for them because um, there's no circular economy solution for the microfibers that are showing up everywhere. So the role of policy, I think, is extraordinarily important. And I recall in one of the panels from the first day, actually, when there are these transboundary issues for which there isn't a market solution, how we much we need these strong policy measures. So in terms of microfiber uh, pollution, it's a problem that I think we're just waking up to. And uh, where policy stands now, and it's only started in uh, June of 2021, in terms of responding to putting different types of measures in place, and it's for 2025, mm -hmm. when it's going to actually come into place. And it's primarily on downstream, so it's primarily on uh, laundry machines, and putting it's in France, and putting a filter, essentially requiring washing machines mm -hmm. to have a filter. So this is great, it's a good start, and if you read the stats, it's gonna prevent you know, I, d I actually don't remember the number, but X, 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 X amount of microfiber shedding. Um, however, what's recently happened is, and I think it's particularly relevant to the folks that are in this room and 
talking about this issue in this region is that upstream emissions are actually considered on par with downstream emissions. Mm -hmm. But it's a really opaque, um, we don't know, you know, the supply chains are so complex, um, they are, that they are so opaque, we don't really know how to really unlock and sort of tackle some of that challenge right now. So in terms of policy, thinking about what type of policies might we need, um, and this is coming from a little bit of having kicked off a supplier-driven action learning research sort of initiative to see how a supplier could drive change or a manufacturer could drive change um, based on those insights. So one, I think, um, policy that really looks at um, and starts to lift the veil on actually where are these issues and emissions happening mm -hmm. upstream that puts an emphasis on what the health impacts are um, to communities here. So much of these policy recommendations are still coming from the West in many ways. So I think um, health, we still don't know the complete health impact, which is amazing when we were standing in front of businesses to make the case of why we need to act on microfiber pollution. There's not actually a lot of research out there in terms of actually what the impact is on our health. We just know, it, you know it can't possibly be good. Um, so health, uh, additional research, and then I think um, something that raises consumer awareness, but consumer awareness in terms of the choices that you make, not just what you can do with your washing machine. So it, I think we might explore some other questions that reveal what role brands can take. Mm -hmm. And I think there's um, some other choices we can have in terms of what brands can take. Mm, thank you, Ariel. It's going it's to lead us nicely into this aspect of design. Um, Amelia, this is a part of the UN Treaty on Plastic Pollution, looking at the design um, and how we make things, how we put stuff together so it doesn't pollute so much. Um, where, where is the potential here, and then what, is the, um, what are the barriers then to the innovation of design? Thanks, Gillian. Um, I guess I wanted to address this question by talking a little bit. So obviously you've made the point already that there's no silver bullet and whilst design is part of the conversation, we do need to be looking across the entire value chain for solutions. But since you've asked specifically about design, I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the work that CSIRO has been leading through our Indo-Pacific Plastics Innovation Network and the Plastics Innovation Hub that we've stood up in Indonesia this year. Um, as part of the co-design process for that hub, we went through an extensive consultation with a whole range of stakeholders in Indonesia and we asked um, people from all walks of life, a whole range of different areas, you know, who was already doing what and where was their real, you know, um, activity happening. We found that there was lots of activity happening at the downstream end around collection, around working with waste pickers. But when we then went through a similar exercise and asked people to identify where is innovation desperately needed but not happening with the, the frequency that we might like to see it, um, there was a real concentration around the upstream end. And so um, when we designed the hub, we specifically crafted challenges that were focused on bioplastics, plastic alternatives, and design for recycling. Um, I thought I'd touch on one of the teams that has been supported through the hub this year um, is a team called Transpirational. And well, if you know a little bit about agriculture or even if you're a backyard gardener, you'd know a little bit about, for example, the black plastic that you use um, that to keep weeds down. It's a great product from the perspective of um, it accelerates plant growth. It means you're not using as many chemical pesticides um, or uh, to keep your weeds down. But presents a huge challenge in terms of um, what do you do with that plastic at end of life because it's dirty, it's low value, um, it's costly to remove and we know that um, use of this plastic is accelerating immensely across Southeast Asia um, and it's presenting a huge challenge. What this product Transpirational um, does, it was a, you know, a polymer that was designed by CSIRO. It's a sprayable, biodegradable polymer mulch. So it does all of the great things that black plastic will do for you, but um, it's been specifically designed to biodegrade um, and leaving behind no harmful chemical residues. Um, what we discovered when you were talking about what are some of the barriers, when we were talking to this team about um, scaling that solution into Asia, one of the challenges that they found was um, in Australia, the product had been formulated for um, application through uh, 
sprayers attached to a tractor. But in Southeast Asia, they realized, ah, oh, we're dealing with a totally different system here because so much of the application is done via backpack sprayers. And they were dealing with different soil types, different crops. And so through the Plastics Innovation Hub, we were able to connect them to partners in this part of the world who were able to help them understand what the lay of the land is, help them to understand how they would need to tweak their product. And now they're working with one of Indonesia's biggest agricultural input suppliers to be able to scale up and um, make that a product that is actually applicable for a part of the world where it's most desperately needed. So, But we know that it will take more than one solution. Um, we know that in those biodegradable, compostable material space, cost is obviously a major challenge, um, and making sure that over time we're able to scale up those solutions so that they become cost competitive with alternatives is going to be key. Um, but we're also conscious in this space, standardisation of labelling requirements so that um, consumers know what it is that they need to do with those products at end of life is also going to be really key. Mm, thank you. Um, Han, just continuing on, um, I mean, where, where, uh, where is your company really looking and focusing and investing in, in research and development and in, in the sort of the design and, um, you know, really sort of trying to nip this in the bud before it causes a problem downstream? Yeah, well, so as an upstream company and also a material science company, uh, innovation and design is very important for us. Mm. Um, we fully aware the, the issue of uh, plastic uh, packaging, plastic waste, uh, and today many of them, they are not recyclable because uh, um, they have a multi-material laminate. It's, it's very difficult to re recycle those type of uh, uh, packaging. The reason there are so many different uh, materials in it is because uh, they provide a different uh, functionality like oxygen barrier or uh, stiffness. Um, but in the company now, we start a, a, a initiative we call it the Design for Recyclability. It's one of the important pillar of our overall uh, circular economy uh, strategy. So we develop a, a better polyethylene resin so that we can replace uh, other type of a material. And before you may have a, like a PPT laminate, that kind of a stand-up pouch, but now you can have a all 100% uh, polyethylene stand-up uh, stand pouch. It's fully recyclable, and we commercialize this uh, technology globally. And many countries, many brands in Asia, uh, they they adopt this kind of a uh, technology. Mm. Um, I mean, the circular economy, it's, it, it is used as a, as a euphemism almost for recycling by the plastics industry sometimes. Um, that was not the original concept of, of, of the circular economy, was it, Joy? Or, um. Well, I, I just want to <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's, you, you're absolutely right. A circular economy is more than just a recycling. Um, it's, a, it's a concept, and to us uh, as a uh, material science company, we want to maximize the value of each molecule as long as uh, uh, possible throughout the whole life cycle. And the recycling is an important part of that, but we also want to develop a, a deliver a circular economy with a low carbon. That's why within DAO, we have a three uh, targets. One is uh, protect the climate. Uh, by 2050, we want to become carbon neutral. That's including our scope one, scope two, and scope three emission. Um, second part, we want to close the loop, uh, make sure 100% of our products sold into packaging application uh, to be 100% recyclable or reusable. And the third one is uh, recently launched a new target. We want to transform the waste. Uh, we really want to close the loop. We want to transform the waste um, to turn waste into feedstock and commercialize a three million metric ton of a circular uh, product, circular solution, no matter if it's a bio-based or waste-based. Uh, uh, waste it's really trying to prevent it from, from becoming waste. Um, you know, how do we extend the life of some of the things that we're using? And surely that's where design is, is crucial in that. Uh, Anna or Amelia, would you like to add to that? How do we sort of make things last longer so we're not just using single use all the time? Um, and I suppose that is one of the key challenges, and I know um, our organisation is looking at plastics from all sorts of angles, including how do we make things last longer, and can we look at alternative types of materials that perform the same types of roles as plastic, um, but do that in... Um, in ways... Oh, you know, using materials that are much more amenable to recycling. Um, I might pass to Han, though, actually, on this one. Yeah, well, we, we do have a lot of uh, uh, product uh, uh, which is 
has a lot of like a benefit to extend the service life of uh, a product. One example is like a, a photovoltaic film. So you know the, the, the PV panel, they generate uh, uh, solar power, uh, renewable energy. Um, and there's a very, uh, it, it's a, there is a certain uh, service life of a solar panel, um, but we develop a product which can extend the service life of a solar panel for at least uh, 10 years, uh, which it could generate more uh, renewable energy, be more uh, efficient. Um, I think um, it was raised in the in the last panel this issue of of trust and assurance, and I think this is a massive aspect as well of of um, you know dealing with this with this issue. Um, Ariel, we, we've perhaps you know underestimate the pollution caused by microfibers for a start, and we see lots of claims around sustainability from brands uh, willing to invest in solutions. Um, are they partnering with? With suppliers, is there enough being done to sort of work with manufacturers, you know, that are sitting, you know, ultimately in Asia, and um, how can that assurance help maybe mitigate that risk when manufacturers are looking to sort of maybe you know, spend a little bit of money on in innovation and drive down those um, either emissions or, or and, uh, increase efficiencies? So it's a great question. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to give a bit of a backdrop on why I would get enthusiastic about that question, um, which is uh, the work that we've been doing at Forum on uh, Microfiber began with a program called Circular Leap Asia. And it was based on the principle of for how do we go from talk roundtables on um, the circular economy and apparel to actually taking action. And, uh, and noticing that manufacturers or suppliers were not actually at the table in terms of actually thinking about what is the agency or role of suppliers in terms of enabling a circular economy. So, um, and perhaps I, I keep thinking of, when we were on the project, I kept thinking of Don Quixote and you know, the big windmill of industry and the, our little effort, um, which was to do three action research kind of projects where a supplier is actually initiated that we want to tackle this issue, or we want to look at what it means to be, uh, do a circular economy. And it was actually really challenging, and because the whole system is actually ge is not geared up for a supplier to actually drive uh, that type of innovation, and part of that's just cult culture. And I'll, I'll, I, I'll speak a little bit more about that in, in just, just a moment, but so I think um, to, the short answer is minimally, um, I think brands are working. I think the system is not geared uh, towards that type of uh, collaboration. Uh, the action that brands are taking now um, on microfiber in particular, there is a great voluntary initiative called the Microfiber Consortium, and they're doing great wor work in terms of bringing the sector together um, and putting out a roadmap of how you might work together. And there are some manufacturers uh, at the table in terms of helping to contribute that I think um, being someone who works with a team who's reading a lot of the research on just how endemic this is, it, it always feels like it's a bit incremental and you can, a brand can check the box and say we joined the collaborative sharing platform and yes, we all need to work together and then you do the research and you're like, yes, but couldn't a brand raise the bar and say really transformational, we're, gonna, we're actually gonna be transformational in terms of how we think about this. Um, so that's what we, as an NGO, would love to see from the brands. Um, and if I were to give an example of what I think transformational might be, so some of that is going to be technical solutions, and I love the, in the idea of the innovation hub on the ground. What are we learning? What's the actual solution we need? I think that's absolutely right. And then material science. Um, particularly in terms of microfiber, uh, there is a shift you can make from, dry dyeing, from wet dyeing to dry dyeing and you'll reduce, reduce, reduce a lot. It's a big investment, it's a big capital investment. I think on the previous panel, we talked about the role of finance, green finance, can they work with suppliers? There's a bunch of solutions that can happen there. There was also someone on the, in the audience that talked about a black elephant, or, or yeah, the elephant in the room, not a black elephant per se. Um, and I think that, I think the real elephant in the room is fast fashion. Um, and when we were doing research into it, you know, it's like, it's like it started kind of 1980s, 1990s. It was enabled by globalization. Um, it, what, it, it made supplier, the job, the, the industry for suppliers is highly competitive, low cost of entry, and a cheap, you are incentivized to do 
as fast as you can, as cheap as you can. So the elephant in the room is fast fashion. It is creating a business model that makes it really hard for upstream players to say, yes, we will innovate and begin to address this challenge because the business model itself sort of puts most, most of the money is made on the brand side and the, the manufacturer supplier is competing on how cheap can they actually mm -hmm. produce and how fast. So I think, you know, part of what Form is about is being a systems change organization and part of what you have to understand is what is the system that is creating this behavior. And I think the underlying system is a lot of the inequity that lies across the value chain. And if we could actually transform some, and I know I'm reaching, I know this is ideal. <laughs> you know, I know it's a, you know, like reaching for the stars, but I actually think what's gonna enable some of this transformation is to actually look at the business models and how value and risk is shared between upstream and downstream uh, solution providers. And it might be that the niche innovators who are kind of starting with a clean slate can do that, like, you know, Ever, I, I don't know all the brains, uh, brands, but Everlane, some of those other no, well-known brands, and they can actually begin with a value chain that has that. So that's the, um, what I think is really going to enable transformation is taking a deeper look at what are the business models that support the current fast fashion sector. And sorry, I have one more thing, if you don't mind. <laughs> and that's that if I had a request, this is my dream list to the brands. Um, so one is the, the transformational action, two is looking at um, this business model. Three is could you just kill the fast fashion narrative? <laughs> you know, you've got all this money, you're really good at storytelling. Fast fashion is, is actually about 40, 50 years old. Could brands come up with a new narrative in the next 30, 40 years of what fashion needs to look like? And that's what I'd really love mm. to see. That's my wish list. That's quite a wish list. It is. <laughs> <laughs> but that, you, we have to imagine this big. I mean, that's what, that's what Greta is asking for. And mm. if you're in your 40s to 50s and you're in a decision-making position, mm. that's what we're supposed to deliver. Mm. We, we sort of keep doing this incremental stuff, and I think this is what's on. These are the, these are the um, challenges that are on the table. Mm. Joy, do you want to add anything to that? In you know, how do you sort of pull everyone into that process and sort of ensure that there's accountability from from beginning to end? Oh, it's such a good good point, and I love I love your passion. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so I guess a few things to say about this. Um, I think we've been stuck in a long time on what to do, but not necessarily how to do it. Um, and even when we get to the how. I keep seeing things that are just a little bit like that last mile how isn't isn't connecting and and I think you know to like all of like we're we organize our society into you know you've got national governments all these different ministries and then you have different roles within the private sector and you've got different roles that advocacy and NGOs and social impact and you know and everybody's playing these pieces but you don't have these connective tissues between it, um, and, and either someone has to play that connective tissue or the organizations themselves have to step a little bit outside of their comfort zone to um, change the role that they traditionally play in order for this like collaboration to really happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm wondering, um, is sort of demonstrating the how you do it part part of the solution? I mean, um, we hear a lot about pilot schemes. So when you're trying these like great innovations and these sort of re research designs, this is a massive part of it, just showing how it could work. Is that something that? You yeah, I think that is so huge. <laughs> um, and I'll just, I'll kind of, I'll try to quickly tell you guys um, the journey that my team has done. Um, I started in management consulting, doing reports and, and lots of modeling um, to really understand these issues. And it wasn't until we actually like worked hand in hand with local government on the front line to actually build waste systems mm -hmm. that we really understood the problem at the level of detail that we needed in order to really transform the entire system, right? Um, and, and that's so helpful because it, it helps you verify what's true and what's not true and, and identify like the things that you don't realize, right? Um, and it also builds the credibility with all of the stakeholders that you need 
to convince in order to do new things. Um, and so, you know, once you have those insights, um, you can build coalitions around you of all these different types of stakeholders. And so then you're going together um, to actually try to change policy. And, and when, when it's too difficult to change because, you know, there's various complexities to it, um, when you can then demonstrate in you know, real life, in our, con in our case, you know, in a city level, a new governance system or, you know, a, a new way of sorting materials or whatever it is, right, then you have a proof point for national change, right? And it's not just you're taking it from this theoretical discussion to something that everyone can, you know, visualize and, and play with, and it just becomes much more tangible. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that journey of going from, um, what do, what do we call it, like ACA was the terminology, but it's like you first acknowledge that there's something, um, and, then, and then you have to actually comprehend it <laughs> before you can commit to it, before you can act on it. Um, and when you make something real, when you actually do the pilot, then um, it's just so much easier for everyone, right? Um, and and then, then you have to solve that, how do you take successful pilots and scale them nationally, right? Which is a whole nother topic, but, um, <laughs> but you first, I think, really need to get your hands dirty um, and stop saying we need to, we should, but actually just do it and, and you know, experiment as you're building the plane, I guess, yeah. <laughs> as we were talking earlier. I mean, you're nodding there. I mean, is yeah. this something that you, you, you see, you talk about innovation hubs, the importance of that pilot scheme to really convince people that there is a business case here? Absolutely. And I think um, one of the m more interesting teams that we've been working with um, through the Plastics Innovation Hub is a team, um, they, they call the Chitarum team, focusing on, so they're working very closely with the government of West Java on trying to provide solutions for the Chitarum River, which is one of the most polluted rivers in Indonesia. And they've really done a lot of work on the ground um, with communities to firstly develop a, a robust baseline, um, but also empowering those communities to be able to run transects so that over time, we're able to actually measure the impact of um, the work that we're doing, they are um, working with government to take over two key waste collection um, facilities in Indonesia, and they will be using those um, is the intention and working with Universitas Indonesia and Monash University are leading the program, working with local communities to trial technologies and to understand the, how they operate in context. So understand what types of impacts are they having for local communities? What types of impact are they having? In, you know, where does the capital return to? Is the local community seeing the benefit? How is it differentially spread across women? How does it impact on people with disabilities? To me, having you know operations like that where, um, you know, as Joy was saying, we can put things through their paces, um, be making a real impact on the ground, but then be measuring, capturing that data and then feeding that back in so that we can replicate those at scale and really demonstrate the case. For me, that's a, that's a really critical part of how do we kind of pursue an impact agenda right now um, and how do we really see a difference through the work that we're doing around innovation so that it doesn't end up being just a, a single stranded pilot, but it ends up being a case study that people build and scale. So couldn't agree more. Uh, investment is obviously, um, you know, a big part of that, and um, you know that's obviously cited as a major barrier to, to waste management. Joy, um, at, at scale, recycling in specific countries is is pretty limited. How then do you make waste collection and sortation an attractive investment option uh, for DFIs and, and the commercial investor? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> um, okay, so let me just start by saying. Waste collection and sortation is one of the most in uninvestable categories <laughs> because it, it's extremely high risk and it's low return. It's generally net cost. Um, but if if we're going to bring waste management to three million people, we've got to figure out how we're going to actually scale that. And philanthropically funded infrastructure is just there's not enough philanthropic funds to do it. So, um, so we're working very hard with several players, including um, the Alliance 10 Plastic Waste and others to really try to figure out this model. And, and um, the good news is that there's a lot of um, potential capital available as um, so much concessionary funding is coming in because it wants to invest in a more um, circular and net um, carbon uh, neutral economy. Um, and so there's like there's a willingness, but there's still this um, fear of risk. <laughs> you know, investors want to make sure that one they can get an adequate return, and two that that 
they will have the surety of that payment. Um, and then you have the complexity of most of waste management's happening at a local level, so you have a sub-sovereign uh, loan challenge, which um, makes it that much um, less investable. And you also have the revenue streams for a waste system tend to be quite um, volatile and un unreliable, and in particular in Indonesia, um, the, the largest portion of the, portion of the revenue stream is household fees, which are collected in cash, door to door, every month, mm -hmm. um, and, and your rates just fluctuate like crazy, and so no investor wants to get into bed with that, right? Um, <laughs> and, and so you have to create a model where um, all of these different parties um, have their needs met, and, and what, we're, what we're sort of working on is, and this is you know, maybe too detailed for, for this discussion, so I'll just go very lightly, but you have a portion of it that is grant funding that covers your technical assistance, you have your traditional infrastructure funding that's um, concessionary, and then you have your, um, you actually subsidizing the OPEX side of the equation, and we're talking about using a revolving credit facility to do that, which basically um, is guaranteed, making sure that the investors have that surety, um, but it also gives local governments time, and then that revolving credit facility, um, and I guess the, the whole thing is done through a service fee that happens at local government that is shared between the village structure and the regency structure. So that's a lot of complication. If you guys are interested in learning more, let me know. Um, <laughs> but um, I think with these types of challenges, we, we get into this thing where we want this easy solution, right? Mm -hmm. um, but to actually tick all of the boxes for all of the different types of stakeholders, you end up getting into these places which are more complex, but just because they're complex doesn't mean that they're not possible. And, and we've been really excited to see um, so many different financial players getting around this, and I think we're gonna have something that's gonna be viable. Um, well, uh, if I may, uh, yeah, just want to add an, uh, another point here. Um, I think to improve the ecosystem, what we really need to do is to unlock the value in plastic waste mm -hmm. so that the ecosystem will be improved. As a plastic company, we're not selling plastic, we're selling the value of plastic. Uh, low carbon footprint, lightweight, uh, food preservation, uh, protect the product. Um, the, the issue today with plastic waste is there is not enough value when you convert it into PCR. It cannot be used for food contact application. Uh, the performance is degraded. Um, so in order to unlock the value in the pla uh, plastic waste, besides uh, like the collection, the policy, investment, uh, uh, we, we need all of those factors, but we also need uh, innovation, we need uh, material science, so that we can upgrade uh, uh, post-consumer recycled material to, a, a second uh, to another level. Um, so uh, in DAO, we develop a solution, we can um, uh, leverage our material size to upgrade the post-consumer recycle content to uh, uh, better performance. And now we can sell uh, PCR material into high-end application like a coalition shrink film. Before it's uh, purely dominated by virgin plastic, and now we can um, use a post-consumer recycle content as well. well. What's the sort of percentage in terms of the, con the recycled content? Is it, is it um, our solution, uh, we have a solution varies between 40% to 70% of uh, post-consumer recycled content, and in the future, uh, we can develop 100% uh, uh, post-consumer material, and even for food-grade application, uh, we are developing this uh, second-generation recycling technology, including like advanced recycling technology. Mm, okay, interesting. Um, perhaps this is a good time to take a question from the audience. Uh, has anyone got any questions? This lady here, we've got some roving microphones. Uh, we have, uh, I think it was this lady here first, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the old comment about the fast fashion industry. The reason that the fast fashion industry can do what it does is because all the externalities of what they do are actually paid by the planet instead. So if you want to fix fast fashion, it's extremely simple. Put a proper price on carbon. End of story, there will be no fast fashion. So that's that comment. I <laughs> and I would like very much to sit down with you at Systemic and discuss what we're doing in Sri Lanka and see if we can actually collaborate in some way because we have some solutions that I think are slightly different to what you're doing. 
but I think could actually also be, because I'm an entrepreneur and you talk about somebody connecting the dots and the one person that does connect the dots goes to government and local authorities and everybody else is an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is actually encourage people to do that. And, and for Dow, can we please discuss chemicals with you um, and, and where you're going to do your secondary uh, solutions? Is it going to be in America or are you planning on doing it in this part of the world? And what is the cost of sending the materials to you in order to get that? Because it's all logistics more than anything else. That was my, it was more of a comment as okay. opposed to a question. Thank you. Does anyone want to respond? Well, I can uh, answer the, the last question. So we commercialize our post-consumer recycle uh, solution here in Asia Pacific. We commercialize globally, but, but we commercialize first in Asia Pacific because here is the center of uh, uh, plastic waste uh, issue. So we have an operation in China, and we are going to launch more operation in South, South and Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia. And you're absolutely right. Uh, how can we get uh, plastic waste into our system? Today, we are like an upstream company. We produce resin. But in, in the future, we could become a downstream uh, company because we are at, at the end of this uh, value chain. So before, we were very uh, high up. But now we need a feedstock from a recycler, which is at the very end of today's value chain. This is how we can create a circular economy, how we can create a closed loop uh, uh, business, uh, uh, business model. So uh, I'm more than happy to talk about uh, uh, how we can collaborate on turning plastic waste into uh, future feedstock. Mm. Okay, any other questions? Uh, gentleman at the back there. Good morning, panel. I'm Ron Tan from My Heart Group. Basically, there's a lot of talk of circular economy. If it's from the scale of 1 to 10, where are we now? This for any of the panel. Thank you. <laughs> 10 being... <laughs> Um, I guess I can start on that. I, I think it depends on the material, honestly. Mm -hmm. I think with PET, we're, we're, we're moving towards a circular co economic direction. Um, I think for, let's say, sachets and a lot of your lower, val pl lower value plastics, the economics aren't viable yet, and we're, we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to have an assessment? Well, uh, microfiber shedding doesn't fit into the circular economy mm -hmm. solution paradigm. Um, which is really risky for itself <laughs> because it means it, it falls off the agenda and it falls off kind of fi how finance is mobilizing to address issues and gets back to why I think policy has such an important role to play um, because it is, um, I think it's 30% of the plastic soup that's in the ocean, so it is quite a big contributor. I had one thought that I wanted to add, and I promise not to make it too long, just that when we did work with these three suppliers to say what would it mean to have a supplier-driven um, innovation, all three are family businesses. Um, and I think that that speaks to where there is a type of um, strength in the region uh, in terms of thinking. Uh, and it's second-generation family businesses saying what does it mean to take this business to the next arc. And I just want to highlight that as something that feels unique to this region in terms of strengths and assets. Maybe if I can just add to yes, that, please. the question there about circularity and where are we at, um, I guess an observation from my side that I find really interesting is when we're talking about plastic circular economy, sometimes the answer actually doesn't lie in the plastics materials itself. And I think we had a questioner um, in the previous session who was talking about in the Philippines, um, you, it, it, there used to be a system that was much more relied on glass, for example, and I think potentially what we might actually see is a movement back in that direction where we can actually get closer to something that looks more like a, a circular solution with rewashing, reuse, yeah. using a different material, so substituting out plastic from that value chain. Um, so just an observation, but... I mean, I, I see the in one of the, in a sort of draft of the negotiations this week, they talk about consumer nudges. Um, I'm not sure if a nudge is going to quite cut it anymore, um, perhaps something a little bit more <laughs> aggressive. Um, anyone else for a question there? Uh, yes, thank you. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for this inspiring talk. Uh, also, thank you, moderator. I've got a question maybe for Joy and Amelia. Uh, we're an NGO, uh, MDPI from Indonesia. We work with small-scale fisheries communities. 
we've got one line of work that is more looking into the community development. So we're not just looking at the technicalities of fishery, but how can we contribute to the household level or community? One of our initiatives in, in the island of Seram in Maluku is to start, maybe you've heard the concept of Bank Sampa, right? And I think, uh, Joy, I think I can, we can completely relate with, uh, you know, having to establish a designated area uh, to, for them to have, whether we, can, uh, whether we call it landfill or not. So my question is, uh, as we're starting, uh, it's been less than a year, um, how do you, how the community, based on your experience, how do the communities respond to a longer term approach on those projects? Do they want to continue with it? Do they really understand and grasp why a landfill or that designated area is needed? Um, just to make sure that it's not just another project that pops up for one or two years and, you know, eventually just disappears. Thank you. Yeah, I guess a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one is Indonesia is a place of community and relationships. Um, and, and it's a place where um, if, you can, if you can help establish a economic model that is sustainable um, and that adds to the community, um, in general, it will be embraced and, uh, and you'll have others that, that take it along. Um, I think you need to work within the existing community structures. Um, and so depending on, you know, if you're talking a, a bank sampo, which is a, a waste bank for everybody, um, where, where people would go and take their, let's say, PET bottles and things like that um, and get some sort of uh, payment for that. Um, usually it's quite small scale. And so you'd be working at what's called an RT or an RWA level um, generally, or, or maybe a village level. Um, and so you would want to work within the governance structure there and probably with the Fisher community and the Pikaka, which is the women's group. Um, uh, yeah, but I think it's very hard and depend it looks like, especially where you're working, because there's only two recycling zones in Indonesia, which is um, Surabaya and Jakarta. So mm -hmm. depending on how far you are from those, like the logistics might just make the economics infeasible. So. I you know, really do that sort of groundwork on can you actually make the economics work? And if you can, then then all the other pieces can come together. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And I'd, I'd probably yeah. second those yeah. comments. So appreciating that w more remote parts of Indonesia present a special challenge, um, yeah. but I thought it was might be worth reflecting on. So another one of the teams that we've been um, supporting through the Plastics Innovation Hub is a team called Do It Then, which I think many in the audience might be familiar with. Um, they are a recycling app that focuses on connecting householders and um, encouraging householders to sort their waste because they receive, a, I guess, a small financial incentive for doing so. And in, um, instituting this system also um, you know, provides a I guess a more stable source of income for waste collectors as well, so waste pickers. Um, really interesting model. It is currently only available in Java. I think they are looking at you know Bali as a as a next step. Um, but I guess making sure that we've got that sort of model right, got the incentives right through a system like that that incentivizes people to sort their waste. You're also building behavioural change. You're changing people's habits. Um, I guess that it's a really s a strong model um, and something that we're really keen to continue supporting. And I think where it makes sense t to look at rolling systems like that out to more remote parts of Indonesia, I guess that's that's where it becomes really exciting. Thank you so much. That's um, some really great, great advice there. I think we'll have to wrap this up and let you all have some lunch. But thank you so much for your attention. Ariel, uh, Joy, Han and Amelia, thank you very much for joining us today and for your, for your great insights. And thanks to the audience for your questions. And we'll see you after lunch for more discussions around the plastic pollution crisis. <laughs>